Hello? Oops, sorry. Is, can you hear me? Is it OK? Uh, hello once again. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I think we could begin. Uh, my name is Galina Yusifovich. I am the book critic, and I'm glad to present the other panelists. This is Arch Tate, translator from Russian. Uh, on the right of me, you can see uh, Julia Yakovleva, uh, detective writer, and Natasha Blanke, uh, a literary agent working with Russian literature. And today we're intending to speak about Russian literature, which is not that great as the great Russian literature is. Uh, you know, the uh, basic problem of the contemporary Russian literature is the great Russian literature of 19th century. Every person who dares to write in Russian today has to answer a very bitter question. Are you as good as Tolstoy? And if the answer is probably not, uh, the next uh, question is then, what's your reason for writing? What are you for? And uh, we basically think that Russian literature uh, must be very serious. Uh, the most uh, harsh word that you can hear about Russian literature is the Russian word bezidiny, which means that this book doesn't contain any serious thoughts, is not serious enough. But the problem is that since we already have Dostoevsky, uh, it's difficult to explain to other people why should they read something else which is, uh, which is very serious and sometimes even boring but which is not Dostoevsky anyway. So today, uh, I think we would like to speak about other ki kind of literature, about the genre literature, about the literature which can be interesting, uh, not only for the uh, profound intellectuals, but for the basic, normal uh, reader. Uh, for example, like me. Uh, because, to be honest, um, I prefer the, uh, the books with some adventures or maybe even with a crime, you know, and maybe with some love in it, which is thought to be rather improper for a Russian book. So the first thing I would like to ask Natasha, who is a literary agent. Uh, Natasha, could you please tell us, is uh, since you're a kind of a diver into Russian literature and you know the, both the Russian literature and the market, the international market, uh, is there any kind of demand for uh, Russian books which could be read not only by intellectuals? Is there any market for Russian fantasy, Russian fantastic, Russian um, detective stories, Russian historic novels and so on, or, or, or no? Thank you. Well, I definitely think so. And uh, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, we actually we had another round table the other day and we were discussing the question of whether or not Russian books can be a commercial success, which I think is closely related to the, the questions we are, we are raising now. Um, and one of the main points was that we're not, uh, I like to think that we're not really, we're not selling Russian literature, we're not selling Russian books, we're selling good books. Uh, and in that respect, it doesn't mat matter whether it's a literary title or a commercial title, or a genre title, if it's a good book, it will sell. And there is definitely, there is always a demand for, for a good book, uh, for a good story. Uh, I personally am not a big fan of drawing um, a very strict border between literary titles and commercial titles because I think that um, a combination of both is definitely possible. A literary title can also be a commercial success and a commercial title can be very literary or both at the same time. Uh, but yes, the, um, there is definitely, there is, the, the, there is still that um, definition. The, there are some books that can be considered more literary and books that can be considered more commercial uh, or more genre oriented or mass market oriented even. Uh, but actually the, the selection of the books you're seeing here is a very good example of the books that have been working really really well outside of Russia. Um, and uh, well 
one of the examples is Metro uh, by Dmitry Glochowski that has been sold to quite a number of countries uh, and that has been working really, really well outside of Russia. Um, and uh, the author Dmitry Glochowski has, uh, has been building his, his own universe basically. And this is also, this is one of the, uh, of the very, um, of the secrets, so to say, of commercial books because I think that the books that work best are the books that create their own universe, that the books that, uh, that create their own, um, uh, their own world, uh, or there is a clear-cut concept as well. Um, uh, that, that are, uh, it's the books that are not necessarily rooted in a, uh, in a certain cultural context, um, that are not necessarily connected to Russia, once again. So going back to the question whether or not that, uh, it, it matters that it's Russian commercial titles or Russian genre books. Uh, it's the books that um, uh, treat universal subjects, uh, that, uh, uh, that treat universal values. Um, and that's what, what's appealing. Also, there is a difference because, as you said, when it comes to literary titles, it's important that they have to be thought-provoking. And uh, very often, Russian literary titles are striving to be very deep and uh, raise very deep questions. Um, but that also results that because uh, in Russian literary title, very often Russian authors are exploring our past that is very uh, strongly rooted in, um, uh, in local subjects that are maybe unfamiliar, the local issues that are unfamiliar for the foreign readers and thus the foreign readers can't really relate to them. When it comes to genre books, when it comes to commercial titles, there are completely different rules, there are completely different laws, there are some plain genre rules and if you follow them you will have a good story and then if you're able to create an additional concept an additional depth uh, depth of field an additional um, uh, additional layer on top of that as happened with Metro for example uh, or Von Gorzer then you have a success you have a recipe for success which is something that really doesn't exist because you can't really, we, sometimes we get that question, what do you have to do to make a commercially successful book, to write a commercially successful book? And well, if we knew that, then everyone would actually write a commercial, commercial successfully book. But, um, uh, but, but basically the, the answer is definitely yes. I think that the um, uh, Russian commercial titles are in demand outside of Russia and uh, a lot of books on these shelves are actually an example to that. Uh, could you please give a couple of names and a couple of titles which are already successful outside Russia? Well, one of the titles is definitely Jana Wagner's Von Gozer, and it's a series, so there is a... a yes, uh, it's, it's not Von Gozer, this is the next novel by the... But the, yeah, it's the book by the author of this particular book. Uh, and it's the book that has been sold to uh, 15 countries, I think. It's been a very big success in France. Uh, France is probably our biggest market for this, uh, for this book. It has been translated into English as well. It hasn't worked just as well in the English market, which is also an interesting point because uh, markets are very different. And one book can be a huge success in one country and be a complete flop in a different country. Um, so uh, Von Gauthier has become a very big success in France. Uh, the, uh, the pocket rights were picked up by Pocket Publisher and the, the initial print run was 30,000 copies, which is a huge success for, for a Russian title. Uh, there is a sequel to Von Gauthier, which is called Truly Human, and it was also published a very um, a big success. But I also think that it has to do with the way French market works and French market operates, because they're extremely dependent on book festivals, and book festivals are really important events, and they invite authors to visit. Uh, Jana Wagner has, has been touring around France uh, several years now. She has visited every single book festival, and... Um, uh, the readers actually do come to those events. Uh, they come, they buy books, they read books, they and th and then the the um, uh, the book spreads through through the word of mouth. And this is a very important mechanism. Uh, uh, we have uh, um, on the on the, on the commercial side, uh, the uh, uh, Yuli Yakovlev is our next hope. Uh, 
uh, we're, we're actually we're putting a lot of effort because this is a completely new project for us. We have just started uh, representing those books, but we think that uh, they will have a lot of potential because what I personally love about those books is that uh, they are using a time period which is uh, Stalin, Russia in 1930s and St. Petersburg, which is the time period that um, considered to be a very diffi difficult, uh, difficult subject in our culture and uh, a lot of literary titles have been, uh, have been written uh, going back to that time period and exploring the things that happened during that time because uh, obviously there is a clear cut connection to what's happening in Russia today. Uh, and I really love the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Yule is using uh, this time period as a backdrop for crime stories because I think it's a, it's a very smart, very intelligent combination. Uh, and uh, it also allows you not only to read the book as a crime story, but also it gives you an overview of that particular time. Uh, and it allows you to get acquainted with, the, with part of the Russian or Soviet culture as well. Uh, so I find it a very interesting approach and I think that a lot of publishers that we have been talking, uh, talking with um, agree with us. So we really have high hopes for this, this particular series. Uh, and hey, well, I have one more question which I will address probably to both of you. Uh, is there something specific about Russian commercial title uh, which uh, will make it competitive on the English speaking market. Is there something that uh, could be very special about our books? How can we win the market with our uh, genre literature? Uh, Julia, what's your opinion? Well, actually, um, I would um, actually I have a little bit um, different view on um, why it happened this way in Russia. I think we still, our literature still suffers. Uh, the Soviet uh, era, we, where um, all uh, crime novels w were stigmatized as light literature. And it was actually the worst you can say about some novel in Russia, call it light or entertaining. So, and I think it's something we still, yeah, we, we are still suffering. But how to challenge international market? It's a difficult question because um, especially for crime novels because the genre of the genre should be rooted in lifestyle and the lifestyle in Russia is very different from from the average lifestyle in Western Europe so you kind of um, compete both in making good story and introducing readers to to the world they have no clue about so but I think that the key factor is a good story and uh, interesting characters. It's like a very universal thing. Just tell me an interesting story. Just win the readers. Yeah. And um, I don't really see any better advice or uh, recipe for, for such a things. I mean, I really, uh, I believe that uh, the good story, the interesting characters, the um, tension you create, this is how you w win independently. It doesn't matter which country you are from. But do you I agree, know. Natasha? I, I totally agree. And I, I don't think we have any competitive advantage unless there is some interesting element that might be extra appealing to foreign audiences. Like, like, like in your case, like I said, the, 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 the fact that your crime stories are set in the Stalin times and Stalin times is still considered to be a very interesting period by uh, by international <laughs> audiences, so that kind of that does add an extra angle or an extra depth because it also allows you to learn something that you maybe don't have enough inf information about. Um, but I also want to to give another example, which is Valentina Nazarova uh, with the, her novel *The Hidden Track*. She's not widely popular. She, she's a new author, and she's not widely popular in Russia yet, as we hope, because we do. I hope that she will become a, a rising star. Uh, but we have started selling her crime stories that have nothing to do, almost entirely nothing to do with, um, with Russia. 
she always has some Russian connection. The main character is m m maybe of Russian origin. Well, all her main characters are actually of Russian origin, but the stories are completely international. The hidden track is uh, mainly plays out in, in the UK. It's a completely English story. It can be read like, uh, uh, like The Girl in the Train or uh, The Woman in the Window. So it's, it's one of those international cosmopolitan stories that have nothing to do with the Russian culture per se, apart from the fact that the protagonist is Russian. Um, and uh, foreign publishers actually find it very exciting because good stories are still hard to come by and it doesn't matter that they come specifically from Russia or from anywhere else. If you have a good story to tell, it will sell. But then if you do have an extra layer, if you do have an extra angle, that might be considered uh, a competitive advantage or an added value, I would say. Maybe not an advantage, but definitely an added value. Well, you know, not all the books that are good for one market are good for, the, for another. Uh, for example, uh, there is a very, very popular, uh, I think it's American novel of, by Amor Tolls, uh, Gentleman in Moscow, probably you've heard about it, because it's a great bestseller. Uh, great bestseller all over the world, but not in Russia. In Russia, it's really hated. And uh, if you only read the reviews, you would find out that the people in Russia don't like this book, they don't believe in, the, uh, in this book, they don't uh, enjoy the plot because they don't find it realistic. And uh, it's a complicated thing for our reader to understand why is this book loved all around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, probably vice versa it works the same so the books which are good for russian market which are uh, which we really do like could be not that good uh, outside russia it's a typical problem and uh, that's what i would like to ask you yuli about uh, uh, because uh, yulia's detective novels are set in stalin times and uh, they are absolutely fascinating and i think they must be very uh, Interest, they can be uh, loved outside Russia as well as in Russia. But uh, our readers, they already know a lot about the, uh, this time, about this world. And uh, for a foreign reader, it must be a very complicated book, you know. Uh, because uh, for Russian reader, Boris Akunin, is very simple author. We don't need any background, any professional background to know what, to understand what he's writing about. But uh, I've heard that many English speaking and French speaking people, uh, they had to read Wikipedia to understand what is it all about because they didn't know the names of Tsars, they didn't know what happened, what was happening at that time in Russia, what it what it what it's all about so the problem with your novels could be that it would be too complicated for foreign reader aren't you afraid of that how do you think is the good plot enough uh, to make a reader to read wikipedia to find unknown words to maybe to read some uh, books on stalin times just to understand what's happening inside the novel well it's actually a very interesting point and i partly i do agree with, with galina that either you um, kind of deliberately write for russian market or for russian audience or you deliberately write for um, western audience <coughs> but at the same time i I don't think I would like to compare myself or situation in our days with the situation when Boris Akunin started his career as a crime novel writer because something important happened in between and this important thing called Netflix series. And you know, it's, it's totally true because now we do not demand this Wikipedia, Google knowing about background or we are fine with having exotic background and okay, dragons, fine. I don't need to really share with lifestyle with Game of Thrones characters, but I do enjoy how they take me in completely another universe and, well, it's never going to happen in my life, but this is why I like it. And this is why I attach to these characters because it's great entertaining, entertainment. And um, I believe that um, we live in, now we are living in a little bit different cultural situation because uh, 
ex uh, an exotic background is not uh, disadvantage anymore. It's, I would say it's actually uh, quite an advantage now. And uh, like it's like, okay, we have seen dragons, but now we, we haven't seen that. And this is kind of good thing about this novel. I can be very wrong about it, but this is my idea, or you can call it hope. And what do you, Natasha, think about that? I think that partly we underestimate the, um, the overall knowledge of European audiences of Russian history, especially that particular time period, because it has been treated so widely that um, it, I don't think that Stalin times would be considered exotic in, uh, by European audiences unless we're talking about maybe Asian countries that may maybe have a different different <laughs> picture or different representation of the uh, Soviet Union in, in that particular time period. But also what I like about the books is that I consider them a slow introduction into that political situation that becomes more complex with every book. And this is something that I really, really appreciate because uh, the main character develops as a person himself and he becomes much more multidimensional from this one uh, kind of square, square box way of thinking because he because he he, he, um, uh, he get, becomes accused of being a spy himself and all of a sudden he starts to see things in a different light and he starts to realize that things are not as one dimensional as he might have thought they were uh, being uh, kind of a faithful communist as he was in the beginning of the book and then he's progressing and he's becoming a different character and we also through his eyes we get uh, introduced to the facts of the Russian history that the main may be less widely known like when he travels to the south of Russia during the time of Golodomor of the Great Famine and with his own eyes when he sees what's happening mm -hmm. and this is something that wasn't even known for people living during that time in Moscow and St. Petersburg because it was, it was never spoken about it was basically it was a taboo to speak about it it didn't exist and all of a sudden he travels, he sees it with his own eyes and our international audiences, our international readers now are also slowly introduced to the unknown facts of the Soviet history. Uh, so in, in, in an entertaining way. Um, so this is something I really appreciate. I don't think it's going to be an obstacle. I think it's, uh, it's actually a very good way to introduce historical facts and integrate them into a genre book, into a commercial title. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is that now you kind of, um, what we are discussing now is the, that uh, the thing is that Russian history of, for example, like Stalin era is now same exotic for European readers or American readers as dragons from Game of Thrones. Now we are kind of need to understand if this is good or bad. And what I'm trying to say that this is probably good because it's nothing wrong anymore with being unknown and un not understandable or ex simply exotic and it's like I mean it probably is the same exotic and this is good okay glad to hear that uh, because uh, I'm a cheerleader of Russian mass, mass market literature and I think that we have lots of titles which can be interested, interesting outside Russia but I'm sorry to find out that they are not still popular enough. But one more thing, uh, uh, you know uh, every literature uh, belongs to, to a country and if the country is not interesting to people the literature wouldn't be interesting either. So what, uh, now Russia is a kind of very interesting to everybody all, all over the world. And probably I would prefer it wasn't that interesting right now. But how do you think, will, uh, how do you think, will this current political situation serve good for Russian uh, literature and mass market literature as well, or, or not? How, what's, your, what's your prognosis? At the moment, I don't really feel that the current political situation, or the current pol political tension, we should probably call it, that it has any negative effect anyway. Um, uh, optimistically, I'd, rather, I'd like to think that if it has any effect, the effect will be more positive because people will want to learn more about Russia and, be, and because Russia is everywhere on the news and it's basically in, um, it's, it's part of the information informational space that we exist in and international audiences exist in so uh, hopefully it will uh, only encourage people uh, rather than put them off um, so that's but that might be very optimistic 
Well, my feeling is that probably it's bad for Russian literature inside the country because it can cause some kind of frustration and like you don't you don't kind of feel like to you don't you're not in, engaged that much in writing or just feel depressed or frustrated. This is definitely a negative impact. But if we are talking about uh, perspective of mass uh, literature, Russian mass literature outside the country, of course it is positive because as uh, well I have read some in some Swedish newspaper that big sexy Russia is back as a bad character to as a back in mass culture in uh, films or in mass novels and of course it's um, it's colorful it's uh, horrible and in some kind of strange weird way it is positive impact if we uh, look at this from this angle but um, yeah, well, each coin has uh, two sides, and um, about negative sides, I'm, I'm aware of. Yeah, Arch, I would like to ask you. You've been translating uh, Russian literature th uh, for many years, and through uh, the Soviet period, and through bad times and good times. How do you think? Do how does the reputation of the country impact the reception of its literature abroad? Well, they do say there's no such thing as bad publicity, but I'm not sure it's altogether true. I remember a Russian publisher friend came to the Frankfurt Book Fair, I think it was, um, bringing her series of uh, Russian literature in translation, uh, full of enthusiasm and hope and optimism about the future, and she was horrified. She went round the book fair. It seemed everything had already been done. There was nothing left. There was no niche that she could possibly enter that hadn't already been exploited and probably rather better than she was exploiting it. Um, I think there are some real Russian treasures still undiscovered, some big assets that uh, Russia has and uh, which could make for success in publishing. I was very interested to hear uh, just really this morning that there is a treasury of brilliant illustration of children's books dating back to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Some of the most famous Russian artists, uh, the structuralists, devoted themselves <laughs> to illustrating children's stories. Uh, partly because they wanted to create the new man, they wanted to change human nature, and they thought children was a good place to start. Uh, nevertheless, the, uh, the artwork that they did is something that maybe uh, could be incorporated now in, uh, in Russian publishing. I remember um, that uh, I, I the first book I ever translated actually was about the Russian style, which was a Russian style in architecture and art and uh, uh, indeed in literature, um, something like the arts and crafts movement in uh, Britain, uh, rather like sort of William Morris. Um, and uh, it was an interest in the Russian past, a rather sort of glamorized Russian past, a sort of romanticized medieval. Uh, Russia. And um, as I was translating this, I came across some amazingly familiar pictures. There was just something about the style that was really, really familiar. And uh, as I looked at the uh, paintings by uh, Bilibin, I realized it was Walt Disney. This was all the Sorcerer's Apprentice. This was so familiar from American cartoons of decades later. And I suspect there's probably actually a direct link. I suspect that the artists uh, of that time had emigrated and they brought uh, those traditions uh, to the studios of Walt Disney. Uh, nevertheless, um, it's um, brilliant stuff. And um, it would be great if some way could be found of um, exploiting that uh, scene, uh, that artistic scene, that illustrative uh, uh, scene which really I, I think people don't know much about. I remember we had talking about the problem of setting and unfamiliar settings. 
uh, we had a visit from a splendid professor at uh, I think Moscow University more decades ago than I care to remember and um, he had just invented something called Lingua Strana Vyedjenia. If you wanted to be a famous professor in Russia, you had to have a school. You had to have invented something. And he had invented Lingua Strana Vyedjenia. And what that was, was basically explaining to poor witless Westerners uh, what was going on in uh, Russian literature and Russian culture. People who simply wouldn't know without a lot of footnotes what it was they were reading about. And this applied the other way around. He uh, was in business for teaching Russians about phenomena of English culture as well. Uh, and I remember the example that he gave was the Hamden Roar, which not every English person, but most Scots people will know what the Hamden Roar is. Uh, the Hamden Roar you can now experience on YouTube, I'm glad to say. Uh, and it's simply Hamden Park was the national football uh, ground of Scotland and the Scots had worked out that by perpetrating the Hamden roar on visiting preferably English football teams they could be so discombobulated and disorientated that the Scottish national team would destroy them. Um, so unfortunately really for the, uh, the professor who I'm sure is long since retired so it probably doesn't matter uh, we now have the internet and if you want to know what the Hamden Roar is you type in Hamden Roar and you find out and the same goes for numerous other things as a translator I'm constantly uh, looking for images on the internet so I can understand what some particular strange piece of Russian headgear looks like or some basket or some, some kind of shoe style uh, so the internet um, has certainly for translators uh, made a great deal of difference, made life much uh, easier than it used to be. One thing I never allow myself as a translator is footnotes, if I can possibly avoid it. And um, the idea of a detective novel with um, a kind of uh, 20 pages of end notes or uh, kind of copious footnotes at the bottom of every page, you know, it's just not going to work. So somehow, I mean, I think to some extent that's the challenge for the translator. You have to work out how to give people a clue. If, if they don't know what a dacha is, call it a country dacha and make it clear that people go and spend time there. Um, I, I, um, I got into trouble with the Gorbachev Foundation because um, I translated Gorbachev's memoirs and um, in places I felt that Western readers simply weren't going to know what was going on because they didn't know what year it was taking place in. So I put the year in. And um, when this went back to the Gorbachev Foundation in Moscow, they were scandalized that I had dared to, uh, to besmirch, to, to violate the sacred text. And they crossed all these years back out. Um, and I put them all back in again. And, and the published version, they're all back in there. Um, but I think there, there is certainly this problem of the setting. Um, it's interesting in a way that people like Geoffrey Archer can write a really popular novel set in Russia with Cossacks, with spurs, and it doesn't matter whether they have spurs on in the bedroom or not really, uh, but they're bedding a princess and there's all this kind of tapestry and stuff. And um, he gets away with it and everyone thinks, gosh, that's so authentic. It's really the setting that makes Geoffrey Archer novels. Uh, in fact, though, I'm sure Russians would be absolutely appalled um, it's just uh, presumably sheer Geoffrey Archerism. Um, and I remember being puzzled that Gorky Park was such a success. Why weren't Russians writing Gorky Park? And I think the answer is that, um, you know, we, ha we have our preconceptions and we quite like to have them reinforced. Perhaps we aren't all that interested in Lingua Strana Vyedinje. Uh, and um, uh, so it's just um, people would rather their fiction was fictitious. Uh, but anyway, um, I would like to think that there's a, a market out there for when I go into WH Smith's, I'm going to find lots of uh, easy, entertaining reading that's been written by Russians about Russia and that English readers are going to enjoy. But I think it's absolutely right. You have to decide, are you writing for a Russian reader or are you writing for a foreign reader? And decide who you're targeting 
And if it's a foreign reader, then you are, uh, as a Russian, you're going to have to think carefully how to make things uh, comprehensible and, uh, and, and, uh, and assimilable to the, to the uh, reader. Oh, thank you very much. You know, there is a very famous anecdote about the settings because uh, uh, during the Soviet period uh, we didn't have many things that were quite standard and no, uh, well known uh, abroad. So when uh, Rita Wright Kavalova, the great translator of uh, American literature, was translating the novel by uh, Salinger, The Catcher in the Rye, she uh, made a couple of very funny decisions. Uh, uh, for example, all the heroes were constantly eating cheeseburgers. And uh, we didn't have cheeseburgers in the Soviet Union. We didn't even know the word. Uh, so to avoid the footnotes, she had to make a change. So all the heroes were eating uh, bread with cheese. Uh, and it was, uh, it was f now it looks really funny. Uh, but at that time, it was probably a good decision because otherwise she would need to explain all these things and the uh, reader would uh, lose contact with the characters. He wouldn't understand what are they doing, what are they eating, uh, who they are. Uh, so the setting is, is really a problem. That's why I was asking this question to all, of, uh, to all the participants of our panel talk. Uh, uh, I'm glad that there are different points of view. So probably the good plot and good characters can uh, make the reader to uh, can make the reader uh, forget about the strange settings and forget that uh, they don't know many uh, uh, details and they don't understand exactly what what's happening in the novel. But probably it is not like that. I know Art that you are the only uh, the only responsible person among all of us. So you have a couple of slides that you would like to show to us. Uh, so uh, if it's possible, could you please tell us about the books that you are translating, that you have been translating, and that you would like to present to, to our uh, audience? Well, um, I feel I'm the uh, odd translator out here. I've noticed in the uh, Literary Translation Center, all the translators appear to be ladies. <coughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> there are a few <laughs> men around and um, on the other hand, uh, what we tend to translate, I suspect maybe it is uh, something to do with the hormones, um, we tend to slide away from fiction uh, and towards um, non-fiction. I do have some fiction. Uh, I have Tsunami by Anatoly Korchatkin, which you can obtain uh, from the Glagoslav website at a very reasonable fee and which I'm sure you'll find very rewarding reading. Uh, and I've also translated um, uh, uh, a work by Oleg Pavlov, A Sisterly, uh, which is an interesting uh, uh, work of fiction. The point of view is that of somebody whose heart has just stopped be beating and He's dying, and as he dies, his whole life speeds past before him. So that he packs this into a novel, and um, at the end of the novel, he's dead. Um, Anatoly Korchatkin's novel is uh, um, called Tsuta Tsunami, and it's set in Russia and in Thailand. And... Um, it's about the tsunami of 2004 in the Indian Ocean, but it's also about the tsunami, the tidal wave of corruption that swept over Russia during the Yeltsin years. And um, talking about background, um, I have an insight into this because I accompanied Anatoly round Thailand while he was writing this novel. Every night uh, he would uh, sit down at an exotic table uh, fronted by palm trees uh, in the uh, wonderful tropical heat with a notebook and write in minute handwriting uh, endless notes uh, and all these notes found their way uh, into tsunami descriptions of all the electrical cables draped on uh, telegraph poles and so on um, which are a feature of Thailand everything's above ground uh, it all went in there 
but the interesting thing was he was a Russian writing for Russians he was seeing this foreign setting and he was describing it as it struck him what he found strange and unusual would strike his readers as uh, strange and unusual anyway I hope that's uh, not fouled my translation and you're now wondering why on earth an English person would want to read it um, but at all events um, those are my two fiction uh, my fictional novels both um, kindly funded by the uh, Institute of Translation Moscow who are also sponsoring this session and uh, published by the admirable Glagoslav publishers and obtainable from their website that's glagoslav.com uh, uh, don't miss it I'd like to talk less about fiction though because I really have voli um, uh, voli uh, moved into um, uh, into non-fiction in 1934 are we doing for time not too bad in 1934 socialist realism was defined by an unpleasant bureaucrat called Andrei Zhdanov who told the first Soviet Writers' Congress, Comrade Stalin has called our writers engineers of human souls. What does this mean? What duties does the title confer upon you? <coughs> In the first place, Stanov informed them, it means knowing life, so as to be able to depict it truthfully in works of art not to depict it in a dead scholastic way, not simply as objective reality, but to depict reality in its revolutionary development. Well, I've had the satisfaction of translating a book about the artist Viktor Popkov, who is actually one of the great artists of socialist realism it's uh, subtitled an artist of genius and I wholeheartedly subscribe to that for a very early age uh, little Victor just sketched obsessively everything that came in front of him he sketched so he is actually somebody who was used to seeing things in front of his eyes one of his best known pictures is the socialist realistically titled uh, the builders of the Bratsk hydroelectric power station and uh, the five looming figures are considered uh, 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 an exemplary example of, uh, of socialist realism admittedly he had to remove the objective reality he had seen in front of him by painting out the tattooed numbers originally shown on the fingers of the builders which indicated they were prisoners from a forced labor camp. He exploded the genre of socialist realism. By the way, objective reality shines through in his paintings. Springtime at the depot could have been another hackneyed depiction of the factory worker with his hammer and the collective farm woman with her sickle. But instead, the magnetism it depicts between two real human beings gives a powerful boost to those supporting the Thor with its rehabilitation of human emotion in the late 1950s. They are flirting. The tired official optimism of the Brezhnev era is evaporated in the face of uh, this uh, picture called Northern Song. It shows a younger generation coming face to face with the, no the war widows in the far north village of Mizen near the White Sea. Their song laments the taking away of their husbands to the war and the spectral little girl on the left is perhaps one of the children they never had. This I particularly like. It really is the artist depicting objective reality, sitting in front of his subject, painting what he sees before his eyes.
Victor Popkov was shot dead in 1974. Reality, in its revolutionary development, came to be renamed Soviet Reality. In 1936, <clears throat> Ivan Shishchikov, in his diary of a Gulag prison guard, published now by Granter with support from Penn, reflected bitterly, I sit about all day reading newspapers which proclaim that life has become better, life has become merrier. Where would that be, I ask myself? Do you mean here, at Baikal Amur, Mainline Central? Here, we are just running out of the last of our dried potato. So far, the life we live is purely theoretical. It is whatever they say it is in the newspapers. If you try talking out loud about the real state of affairs, you'll soon be in big trouble. The cliché for describing writers who cast doubts was besmirching our Soviet reality. You can't translate that into sensible English because we don't understand what besmirching reality is. This is why there was such fury when Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago appeared in the 1950s, writing off 20 years of mendacious propaganda. Ilya Ehrenborg said then that even if the world were to be entirely covered in asphalt, Pasternak had shown that a blade of grass would nevertheless appear. Another writer who describes objective reality is Yelena Zhevskaya. Uh, her book, Memoirs of a Wartime Interpreter, is being published at the end of this month by Greenhill Books. Again, I commend it to you warmly, even though I won't be getting royalties. It's the warm eyewitness story of a woman who improbably was an interpreter for Smersh, uh, one of the grisliest parts of the Soviet secret police system. But she's actually a lovely, warm, motherly person who has obviously uh, been present during some pretty horrendous interrogations. She was present with the... Okay. She um, followed the Red Army from uh, Moscow to Hitler's bunker in May 45, and she was one of the first to enter the bunker, first non-Nazis. She found there, amongst other things, Joseph Goebbels' diaries, uh, Hitler's propaganda chief, and she was present at the discovery of the charred remains of Hitler and Eva Braun. In Goebbels' diaries, she found reflections on uh, propaganda techniques. She was later entrusted with the safekeeping of a burgundy-colored jewelry box containing conclusive proof of Hitler's death, namely his jaw and denture. The newspapers of the Allied troops had already come out with a resounding headline, Russians find Hitler's body. Yelena writes, Among our troops something ridiculous was going on. People were suddenly being urged to hunt for Hitler. This was a deceitful charade, a weird attempt to disguise the fact that his body had been found. A pretend search. A report appeared in the Moscow newspapers claiming he might have landed in Argentina or was possibly hiding with Franco in Spain. The Soviet secret police launched Operation Myth to conceal the fact of Hitler's death. Eyewitnesses were tortured in an attempt to make them say he was still alive. Yelena's superior went to Moscow to report to Stalin on the evidence of Hitler's death and was not received. He was told by Abba Kumov. I had problems thinking what accent to give Abba Kumov. I decided David Cameron. Comrade Stalin has familiarized himself with the entire course of events and the documents relating to the discovery of Hitler and he has no questions. He considers the matter closed. At the same time, 
Comrade Stalin said, but we shall not make this public. The capitalist encirclement continues. Rumors were spread that Hitler was being protected by the Allies, who were planning to use him to start a war against Russia. The foreign enemy, Helena comments, and no less the domestic enemy, were an essential component of the system Stalin created. He loathed the idea of détente, and there would be less pressure for it if Hitler was still alive and secretly hiding somewhere. I co-translated Svetlana Alexievich's uh, Chernobyl prayer with uh, Anna Gunin, who was here earlier this morning. It's a story of how the party authorities decided to conceal from the people of Belarusia the fact that a radioactive wave was coming their way, gave them no advice on prophylactic measures they could have taken, gave them no issue of iodine tablets which were available. Everything was done to conceal the fact that there was a problem because Chernobyl also made plutonium for the Soviet atomic bomb and they believed that the explosion had been caused by the CIA. The head of the, um, um, uh, the nuclear department of the Academy of Sciences had all his equipment confiscated and uh, received threatening phone calls at home. Stop trying to scare people, Professor. We'll send you off somewhere you'd really rather not be. Don't know where we mean? Have you forgotten? Don't be in such a rush to forget. This is 1984, 86, sorry. Have you forgotten? The Institute's staff were bullied and intimidated. They could lock me up in a lunatic asylum. That was what they were threatening. I might die in a car accident. They warned me of that too. Okay. I will move swiftly to a conclusion. There goes Gorbachev. The greatest privilege in my career has been to translate Anna Politkovsky as Putin's Russia, which appeared in 2004 with the support of Penn. In the introduction, she discredits the pretensions of the purveyors of neo-Soviet reality. She wrote, I am not a political analyst. I am just one human being among many. A face in the crowd in Moscow, Chechnya, St. Petersburg and elsewhere. These are my emotional reactions jotted down in the margins of life as it is lived in Russia today. It's too soon to stand back, as you must, if you want to analyze anything dispassionately. I live in the present, noting down what I see. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we still have uh, some time for just one or two questions. So if you have any questions, it's the right time to ask. OK, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, what is the relationship between the literature which is popular in Russia and the one which is translated? Are those the same books or the titles are different? Uh, I think Natasha will be, is the, the right person to answer this question. Well, I wouldn't say that there is no relationship at all because uh, if, uh, if a book is completely unnoticed in Russia, chances are it just will not sell. I mean, it will not, we the agents will not know about the book, will not, because I mean, I mean, most of the times that there are several ways that the books find to us, to agents or to translators, because sometimes translators are acting as ambassadors for a certain book, but there, there still has to be a buzz, there still has to be a word of mouth, there has to be book reviews, the book has to be somewhere um, basically to, to end up, to, to attract the attention of publishers, agents or translators. Uh, so yes, the book has to be relatively uh, known in Russia, but commercial success is 
Definitely. I mean, there are some books that are incredibly successful in Russia that will never become a commercial success outside of Russia and vice versa. So that relation doesn't really work. But for a book to travel to begin with outside of Russia, it has to be noticed. It has to be noticed by the critics, it has to be noticed by the readers, and it has to be uh, it has to exist in, in, the, uh, in the informational space, so to say. Thank you. And just one more question. I think if we have more questions, we can go to the stand and talk a bit there. Are there efforts to translate from minority languages inside Russia? Uh, so could you repeat that? Are there efforts to translate from minority languages from the republics? What there used to be oh, I, 17 I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they are, and languages. I know, some, I, I know of a Georgian agency who is very active sell, selling Georgian rights. I actually have been part of an effort to promote Georgian literature as well. The Georgian Ministry of Culture invited foreign publishers. I was representing Sweden back then. The um, uh, Georgian Ministry of Culture invited a delegation of Swedish, Scandinavian publishers to Georgia to be able to sell Russian titles, to present them. Uh, it was a publishing conference to present them, to, uh, uh, to let the publishers meet the authors, and it was a wonderful effect. It was a wonderful, commendable effort. Uh, there are similar efforts in Armenia, for example. Um, I know of an Armenian uh, agency that is very actively selling uh, Armenian titles. Um, and uh, um, there are Ukrainian titles that are widely translated, Moldovan titles. So yes, there are definitely, there are definitely efforts in that direction. Uh, we as an agency, we only work with Russian language titles, not uh, because of any political reasons, but basic, for the basic fact that we should be able to read the books ourselves. So if the book hasn't, isn't available in Russian or any other language that we are able to read, then we will not be able to, to work with it. Because we have to love the book ourselves as agents to be able to engage the publishers or enthuse them. Okay, uh, just, okay just one short question. Is it possible to make it short? Because we need to leave right now. Um, I just wondered, is it possible to say something very briefly about the fact that Yulia is going to be published in English this summer, that her children's books, uh, the first of her children's series is coming out um, from Puffin Books. It's a shame that you haven't mentioned that at all yet. Um, I would like to ask a question about it, but I, I just wondered if you had anything to say about that. Um, I, I didn't well, shall I ask a question quickly? Uh, sorry, uh, could you please repeat it? Because it's yeah. pretty noisy here. I couldn't, hear the, I couldn't hear the um, question well. I, just, I thought it was a shame that we haven't mentioned the fact yet that um, the first of Yulia's children's books is coming out in England this summer. And uh, my question, if you have time to answer it, Yulia, um, is uh, um, obviously for uh, um, British and English readers, for children, um, there's a lot of uh, material in it. it. This is a book that's set in um, the Soviet um, uh, in the 1930s in the Stalinist purges. It's really uh, um, this, you know, the era of repression. It's a difficult text for children, but it explains it well, and children in this country will learn a lot from it, but in the same way as they would learning about any historical period. How, how much did, did Russian children learn about the story? How difficult is that for Russian children? Mm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, actually, in fact, I don't know. Uh, you <laughs> probably should ask children. <laughs> I really don't. Well, they probably... But I, like I told you in the very beginning of our meeting, well, tell them a story, win them by the story. But the historical reality, come on, dragons have nothing to do with their lifestyle. So, so neither does Stalin era happily. And well, story and characters, is, is, this is how you win, little yeah. buddies. <laughs> you know, I think I can answer your question at least partially because I have two children and my, young, my younger son, who is 11 now, he's read uh, the book by Yulia and he didn't even understand that it's, it can be complicated or difficult because he was reading it as a fairy tale. Uh, and it, uh, 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 the fact that this fairy tale is set in some real, uh, time and real place, it was not very important for him. So I think that uh, the children are used to read the books set in some strange places, in some strange worlds. And the Stalin world is 
not more strange than any other. So I think that for Russian children, it's okay. It's, I don't know whether it is a convertible effect, whether it is the same for the children from other countries. But in Russia, it, uh, at, at least in my case, it worked. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for coming. We can we, uh, Excuse me, I, uh, can you please take the microphone because I couldn't hear you. All that is needed is Yulia's surname, please. Surname Yakovleva. Yulia Yakovleva. You can find her books on, on the Russian stand. But without the surname, I wouldn't. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming. Thank you.